Understanding how materials interact with not only thermal radiation that's coming off the body, but also solar radiation that's incoming from the sun allows you to examine existing materials that are used in clothing, but also modify them and develop new materials that can better either for warm environments reflect solar radiation and emit thermal radiation, or for cold environments absorb solar radiation and retain thermal radiation. Welcome to It's a Material World, the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. With your hosts, Pranith Upadhyay and Tom Miller. In today's episode, how material innovations in clothing better protect us from the elements. Hello, everyone. Today's guest on the show is Dr. Haskell Beckham a Senior Director of Innovation at Columbia Sportswear. He is an expert in the connection between material science and engineering and its impact on the design and manufacturing of apparel. We are super excited to explore the connections between these two fields. So thank you so much for being on the show, Haskell. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Morning. Good morning. So to start us out, from an outsider's perspective, we take clothing for granted. It's something that we have every day and we've all worn clothing every single day since we've been born. So it may not seem like it's an area that has a ton of space for innovation, but given your title, that's there's obviously very much <laughs> a space for that precisely. So where is there innovation happening in the realm of clothing and apparel and in particular in the space of outdoor apparel, which Columbia specializes? Yeah, great question. Great way to start this. I lead a team at Columbia Sportswear, and we primarily focus on the development of new materials for integration into clothing and footwear that is intended for people to wear outside. Columbia Sportswear is in the outdoor industry, and one of our mottos is we connect active people with their passions. We create clothing to keep people warm, dry, cool, and protected so they can stay outside longer especially given what's going on in terms of this pandemic. You know, outdoor spaces have been shown to be really good places for us all to be (laughs) for (laughs) for, uh, that and many other reasons. We work very hard to create the clothing that helps humans go into environments in which they're not naturally comfortable. And so, I mean, based on what you're doing, your your role at Columbia gives you the opportunity to sit in the driver's seat for innovation in the apparel industry. So, you know, why are you so passionate about this industry and really the potential impact of material science in this field? Well, so to answer that question, I have to talk about myself a little bit. I actually grew up in the Southeast and I spent, I believe, most of my childhood outside. Um, (laughs) I'm I'm pretty passionate about the outdoors. I'm also passionate about science and uh, turns out materials. So this job and this company allows me to combine two of my passions. It's a lot of fun because as opposed to just Looking at the the marketplace of what the available materials are, we ask the question, well, you know, what's missing? What can we do in terms of creating a new material that will make an existing product or a new product better in terms of keeping people warm, dry, cool, and protected? And there really is plenty of space for improving materials, for creating new materials, and and that's what we focus on. And we're a show about material science, so... Let's get into that side of it. So what explicitly are those material science principles that are applied to this clothing and apparel space? Yeah. So, you know, to answer that question, I'd have to give some specific examples, which, of course, I'm very happy to do. At Columbia, we tend to focus our efforts on the material side into these buckets of warm, dry, cool, and protected, as I've mentioned now a couple of times already. And so I, I like to point out the humans are the only mammals on the planet insist on and have always insisted on venturing into environments in which they're not naturally comfortable. Um, so for example, here's a question for you guys. What's the, what's the optimal air temperature for humans at rest? So not really active yet. Wouldn't it be body temperature? Because if it was below body temperature, you'd have like a tendency to go to like some sort of hypothermia maybe. So that's a good guess. Not correct, but it's a good guess. Um, Is it lower or higher than what Tom It's lower. Said? It's lower because okay. you know, just due to metabolism, you got to you got to get rid of that excess heat. And so, if the outside temperature right. is the same as body temperature, heat's not going anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to have a 
you got to have a thermal gradient for heat to move. One of the courses that I believe you guys take in material science and engineering is heat transfer. Yes. Okay. Transfer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was just going to say, like, I don't know, when I, whenever I think my ideal temperature, I think 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So that would be my guess. That's another great guess. Actually, the actual answer is in between. Uh, it's about 81 okay. degrees Fahrenheit which is between body temperature and what a normal indoor temperature is, or no, no, we mm-hmm. say is a normal indoor comfortable temperature. And that's because, and, and this is another reason why people wear clothing, not just to protect them from the elements in the outdoors, but for social reasons. And humans in general are walking around with clothes on in indoor environments because it's not socially acceptable for us all, all, to be all walking around naked. Um, <laughs> Right. That is and so because we have that layer of clothing on in order to be comfortable, that is to be at what's called thermal regulation, the room temperature, the ambient air temperature needs to be lower than that optimal temperature of 81 degrees Fahrenheit because you put a layer of clothing on. And so you've got resistance to heat transfer there. Right. And so now that the optimal air temperature is not 81 degrees Fahrenheit, but actually a little lower. And it turns out typical indoor temperatures are 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, you mentioned so something like that. There's actually a good bit of research going on, even in universities, that are trying to develop clothing that will allow indoor air temperatures to be set to higher, because especially as the, the planet heats up, we're always looking for ways to conserve energy generally. And cooling buildings is a tremendous drag on energy. It requires a lot of energy to keep buildings at that 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit that humans are comfortable of simply because of wearing, wearing a layer of clothing. And, uh, you know, if we can raise that a degree or two or three by using clothing that actually lets more of your body heat get out and allows you to be at thermal regulation, then you can save a lot of energy on the planet. Kind of digress there. What, what was the question again? Yeah. So I was just going to say the, the question itself is what are the material science principles that are applied to the clothing and apparel space, but it sounds like, you know, one of the major ones here is heat transfer, right. you know, that you have yeah. to be very cognizant of that when you're designing a piece of apparel, especially in the outdoor setting. That's right. So heat transfer, very important. And I'm talking about heat transfer in all its forms, conduction, convection, radiation in particular. And we spent a, a lot of time at Columbia Sportswear really digging into all those three major modes of heat transfer. There are some other modes as well. But uh, in particular, the, the, the radiation mode, which is something that I would say many other brands have not spent as much time looking into to the extent that, that we have at Columbia. And it's really important because a human at rest loses, especially in a, in a cold environment, loses a lot of heat via radiative heat loss, via radiation. And in the summertime or in, in a warm environment, um, you actually can get, you gain a lot of heat from the sun. Understanding how materials interact with not only thermal radiation that's coming off the body, but also solar radiation that's incoming from the sun allows you to examine existing materials that are used in clothing, but also modify them and develop new materials that can better either for warm environments reflect solar radiation and emit thermal radiation or for cold environments absorb solar radiation and retain thermal radiation. That's cool. I remember in, you know, Tom and I's transport class, we were talking about conduction, convection and radiation, but a lot of the times the radiation was kind of considered negligible, like we could cancel it out and we would just focus on conduction and convection. But that's super cool that in this industry that actually plays a significant role. And that's where Columbia is innovating where, whereas some other companies may not be putting as much of a focus on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And as a specific example, before we move on to other topics, our I would say most iconic product is something that we call Omni Heat Reflective. And it basically is was originally inspired by what's referred to, I think, in the popular culture as the old NASA space blanket. If you've ever run marathons or actually seen pictures of people who run marathons or after marathons at the end, you'll see people standing around with these plastic aluminized sheets on. They're really kind of, they're the mylar... Yeah. They got vapor deposit of aluminum on there, and they do that because you you want you want to maintain some heat in the body after you do that, especially if it's kind of chilly out after doing that. And these little emergency thermal blankets work by simply reflecting thermal radiation that's coming off your body. You know, radiation is a very important component of heat transfer or anything in space because there is no air, so there's no uh, there's no convection. Certainly, very little conduction. So, uh, so there's a lot of heat gain and heat loss via radiation. And so, 
So NASA developed these materials where they took advantage of the unique properties of metals in terms of reflecting thermal radiation and also having low thermal emission and uh, developing ins insulated materials. And so if you look at a, a Columbia jacket that has omni heat reflective, it's basically the liner material where it's this shiny silver coating on the liner fabric. And it's applied in what we refer to as a discontinuous fashion because the body is constantly giving off moisture. And so I think the metals are good at reflecting thermal radiation and helping retain body heat, but they're also really good barrier materials. If you look at potato chip bags, for example, and you look inside the bag, you'll see a, a vapor deposited layer of aluminum on there. And there's, it's there to basically maintain the freshness of that food because it's a really good berry material. You don't want moisture and oxygen coming in and out of the food while it uh, sits on the shelf before people purchase it and consume it. So you don't really want to wrap yourself in those space blankets for very long. At some point, you'll you'll overheat because it can't breathe. It won't let that yeah. moisture that the body's constantly giving, giving off get out. And so 10 years ago, I think it was, Columbia Sportswear developed a method and a way to basically apply that aluminum in the form of little dots on, on a fabric that they then integrated into their jackets as the liner that reflects the thermal radiation, but also allows uh, the moisture to get out, out from the body. So it breathes in addition to keeping you warmer. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the potato chip thing, because that was actually precisely my senior design project was optimizing one of those aluminum oxide barrier structures. Uh, so it's funny that, that that comes up here as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great example too, of the use of different kinds of materials in apparel. Um, you don't normally think of with the exception of, I guess, medieval armor. <laughs> you don't normally think of the use of metals in apparel, but Columbia Sportswear has really revolutionized the outdoor product lines with the use of materials like that. Now, you know, it's applied in a very, very thin layer because otherwise it would add like heavy medieval yeah, armor, weight. lots of weight. Right? Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's stiff compared to um, compared to the polymers that make up the fibers that make up the traditional textiles that most of our apparel products are, are made out of. But, you know, it's it's an example of the kind of things that we in particular in, uh, are doing to innovate in the apparel space to help keep people warmer and so they can stay outside longer. Yeah. So going off of that, I was wondering, how do you strike that balance between improving existing materials in this industry versus developing new materials altogether? Yeah, another great question. So one of the things we always have to consider is cost. And I'd like to talk about that for a second, because actually it's an important, I think, design criterion that I'm not sure how much we, I'm not sure how much work we do in an academic setting really expecting that until you guys get to your senior year and you take a, I think a capstone senior design class, you know, a little bit about my background. You guys know this. I taught at the university level for 20 years in a textile engineering school and then a material science and engineering school before leaving academia to join a scientific and engineering consulting firm, which ultimately led to my current job at Columbia Sportswear. And so I'm pretty intimately familiar with the kinds of courses and the content that we teach in material science and engineering programs. And it wasn't until I got out into the industry that I, I realized that, well, you know, cost is really important. Because, and it's really important because you're trying to deliver something to consumers at a price point that as, mu as many people as possible can take advantage of. And so, you know, one of the things we also like to say at Columbia Sportswear is we, we want to unlock the outdoors for everyone. We're not creating product for just the top 1% of consumers out there. We're really creating product that everyone can afford and use. And the reason I bring up this cost issue is because you asked the question about well, how do we strike the balance between using the existing materials versus innovating new materials. If materials are already existing and in the marketplace, they're obviously affordable, right? Cost is not really going to be an issue there. Every time we create new materials, we have to consider cost as a design criterion. It's part of, it's part of the work that we do. And sometimes it really restricts us from doing some of the things we want to do. And so that's really, you know, depending on the kind of product you're making and, and the kind of audience you, you'd like to reach, it, it, it's one of the trade-offs you make sometimes. So that's one answer to your question, cost, in terms of striking a balance. Almost every innovation we create is going to be a little bit more expensive. But then we go back, another way to innovate is to go back and look at process innovation and say, hey... Is there some way we can actually create this new material now using a different process or a different combination of materials that actually reduces the cost and therefore allows us to, to deliver it to a wider audience? And so we do a lot of innovation in that space as well. And I'm sure everybody else in the industry is working on that also. 
The other consideration is what are existing materials not doing that we'd like to do, or what are they not doing that we could do better by using different materials? And, you know, we've already talked about the example of putting very thin layers of metal in a discontinuous pattern on the surface of fabrics. Metals have very different properties from the polymers that make up the fibers that make up the textiles. And so regular textile fabrics will not reflect thermal radiation, for example, the way that metals do. And so by putting these metals on the surface, we're able to reflect thermal radiation and create a material that has enhanced thermal resistance or greater thermal retention than the fabric does without the metal. And so two major considerations there. You know, the first consideration is what are existing materials what, what are they not, what problems are they not solving or what problems are they actually creating that we could, uh, that we could solve by creating or innovating a new material? Yeah. And so going more into those textiles and fibers side of it, can you talk about some of the specific textiles and fibers that are being used in creating outdoor apparel and if they differ at all from those used in indoor apparel? Yeah, sure thing. So humans have been wearing clothing since for at least 170,000 years. And of course, all the early clothing all the way up to the advent of synthetic fibers have been natural based, right? Cotton, wool, silk. And then um, with the advent of synthetic fibers like polypropylene, nylon, polyester, which happened just in the last century, we, you know, we had access to materials that had different properties. For example, if you look at the natural materials like wool, cotton, silk, uh, and others, they're pretty hydrophilic in general, meaning they absorb Mm -hmm. moisture. And if you look at a lot of the the synthetic materials, they're 10 more toward hydrophobic, which means they don't absorb as much moisture. So polypropylene, polyester, nylon. And so that could actually, just from that property alone, you can imagine that that might be useful for something you'd want to wear outside to keep yourself dry, right? Something that's going to be hydrophobic, not going to absorb as much rain, it's not going to absorb as much sweat with active human in the outdoors and your your body's putting off a lot of moisture. As long as that material can breathe, it'll go through there as opposed to absorbing into that material and, and being held there. So a lot of the materials that are used in the outdoor space for apparel and footwear really are synthetic based. Polyester is a big one. Nylon is a big one. Polypropylene used a little bit, not as much as it used to be, but mostly uh, more synthetic than the natural materials, I would say. But again, these are all the major fiber classes. You mentioned this, how humans have been wearing clothes for the past 170,000 years. And I think that's a really cool topic that we could dive into. So let's talk about the history of clothing and how it aligns with the history of material development. You told us before, I mean, mankind's first examples of clothing were furs, skins, and even whale intestines that were sewn together to be waterproof, right? So clearly we've come a long way since then. So can you talk about how material advancements over time have translated to innovations in the apparel industry? Yeah, sure. I mean, you you just mentioned it, some of the early materials. And if you look at materials and what I remind my team members and people that I hire and actually people that I meet all the time, what I remind them of all the time is remember your fundamentals, a view the world through the lens of fundamentally through a sci- as a scientist or an engineer. Don't forget what you learned in, uh, in college <laughs> or even high school for that matter. You know, for most folks who major in science or engineering in college, you know, they took chemistry in high school. I, I often will go back to just high school chemistry to to remind people that, you know, that's a really useful way to view the world when you're doing the kinds of things uh, that I'm doing and the people that I work with are doing. And the reason I say that, because you look at the natural materials that are used to keep people protecting the outdoors, furs, fibers. If you think about it fundamentally in terms of the kinds of materials that keep people warm, we use that as as a first example. It's really just trapped air. Air works as a good insulator because it has a low thermal conductivity. And so all the furs, you know, bundles of fibers that are stuffed between different layers of fabrics, it's just different forms of trapped air. Now, uh, you know, a lot of brands, including us, will make a big deal about all our different insulations. We've got down, we've got synthetic, but the truth is they're all just different forms of trapped air. And if you view it in that light, then it allows you to, to actually think about it, I think, a little bit differently, right? Well, if, if the insulating component is really just the air, then everything else is just the container, right? Mm-hmm. So what is it about the container, whether it's de- feathers, 
or fur? What is it about the container that makes it a good container for trapping air? How could it be improved? And, you know, where do we go from here? All right. And so from fur and, and, and feathers, we went to uh, actually most insulation nowadays, most traditional insulation is synthetic fibers, either continuous filament sheet, what we call sheet insulation, or chopped up synthetic fibers that we uh, refer to in the industry as, as faux down. You know, these are just different forms of trapped air. And if you do it that way, then um, I think that's a good platform from which to think about, you know, how can we make it better? So that's one example. The other example, I don't know if you want to go into this now, is, is really rain protection. Because I love the example that uh, we talked about earlier and you mentioned a second ago was <laughs> uh, whale intestines or seal intestines. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Yeah, go into it. I want to hear it. <laughs> sure, yeah. So one of the big areas that uh, all outdoor companies uh, look at is protection from rain. And if you look at what humans used to wear in terms of protecting themselves from rain, a lot of times it was just materials that would sufficiently shed rainfall that, you know, just it, it wouldn't absorb in the material and uh, wouldn't get uh, next to the skin. And so that's kind of an interesting example, sort of whale intestines that were kind of glued together to form garments to keep people dry. And other examples are bundles of thatch. You've maybe seen roofing materials for old buildings that were sort of straw or thatch, mm -hmm. it's called. So that was actually used as well back in the day <laughs> uh, to shed rainfall. But uh, the whale intestine thing is, is not widely available to all humans. <laughs> Maybe for, for good reason. Um, <laughs> uh, even, though, even though the thatch type raincoat might be available to a larger fraction of humans on the planet, that, that thing's pretty heavy in terms yeah. of, uh, you can imagine a, a thatch roof wearing that as a, as a garment to keep the rain on. And so a lot of the modern materials, which I mentioned a second ago, uh, which are based on synthetic materials, which are hydrophobic, and they do a good job at shedding uh, rainfall but they don't necessarily keep you completely dry unless it's a continuous film. And so for example, you know, a textile fabric and a fabric is just a collection of yarns that are interlaced and yarns are made of fibers is actually mostly air itself. You know, we don't typically think of it that, that way, but if you actually do a calculation, measure the thickness of the fabric and look at the density of the material, whether it's polyester or nylon and calculate the density of the fabric versus the density of the material. If it was 100% polyester, 100% nylon, you'll find that most fabrics are more air than solid material. Um, so as a result, even though the hydrophobic materials do a pretty good job of, of shedding moisture to keep you dry, they won't keep you completely dry, especially if you're in a, in a really, really bad rainstorm. And so as a result, the industry has settled on a series of materials that we call fabric membrane laminates. And so we have a fabric, which again, as I said, is mostly air. And what I mean by that, it's got a lot of holes in it. And then we take a film and we actually laminate that film to the fabric. And the film itself is very, very thin, 30 microns typically, or smaller in terms of the thickness. And that film itself has a lot of microscopic holes in it. And what it does is does a better job of keeping the water out, but due to the microscopic holes in there, actually allows it to breathe a little bit as well. So it brings up another topic in terms of keeping the rain out and allowing you to breathe. There's always a trade-off when you're trying to develop these new materials in the outdoor space. I just had a follow-up. So is that hole size meant to be smaller than typical water droplets, but large enough so that air can flow through it? Is that what the, the goal is or what's the deal there? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I, I really love clarifying this because if you read the internet... <laughs> <laughs> Um, you'll see that a lot of explanations that exist for what are referred to as waterproof, breathable fabric membrane laminates talk about the importance of the size of the holes in the membrane part of the membrane fabric laminate. And it is important. The truth is you, you want those holes to be as small as possible so that they can resist rain getting through. But you also want them, on the other hand, you want them as large as possible so they can actually transport as much moisture as the body is is giving off and you know human at rest these materials are actually quite good but when humans get active they actually start to put off a good deal of moisture and it becomes really challenging for these fabric membrane laminates to keep up so it, it's not just the size itself so as it you know to get back to where i was where i was going there it's not just the size of the hole itself that's important but it's actually the surface tension 
or surface energy of the material itself. And so, for example, this entire category of material that are used in the outdoor space to keep people dry and yet still breathe was, uh, to my understanding, was really developed in the 1970s by a company called Gore, where they created this material that is expanded polytetrafluoroethylene. And expanded polytetrafluoroethylene was really kind of the first membrane that was used on a widespread basis for in fabric membrane laminates uh, to keep people dry, but also allow moisture from the body to actually get through it. So those holes are, are very small. The world knows this material is Gore-Tex. But the other thing is that polytetrafluoroethylene has very low surface energy. And mm -hmm. so, so raindrops, it takes more pressure to get rain to go through a material like that than it does for uh, most other materials. The bottom line is not just the size of the hole itself, but it's actually the surface energy as well. And so our next question here is actually inspired by one of our listeners to our show. So we asked our followers on, on Instagram what questions they may have for you, given your background. And Megan was wondering, do performance and sustainability ever have trade-offs when it comes to innovations in this industry? And if so, how do you find the optimal balance between the two? Yeah, I would say everything has a trade-off, yeah. uh, no matter what you're comparing. We talked about that a little bit already. You know, if you want something to be waterproof and breathable, uh, there's a trade-off there. And so you, usually the materials that make it to marketplace are, are some optimal balance of the two, you know, given the cost restrictions as well that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, for su sustainability, depends on how you define it. There are lots of different ways to define it. We do lots of consumer insight studies at Columbia. And one of the things that we've learned is that consumers in general have very different ideas of what sustainability actually means. And, you know, as scientists and engineers, it's easy for us to understand because, you know, a given material may be good in terms of reducing uh, energy consumption, but it may not be as good in terms of water consumption, right? So there, and so that's what I mean by different ways to define sustainability. You're trying to minimize water consumption, trying to minimize energy consumption, or are you trying to create something that's going to be easy to recycle? Are you trying to create something that is going to be easy to reuse. So there are lots of different ways to consider sustainability, but it's become such a, an important part and always has been an important part, especially of the outdoor industry, right? Because you know, the last thing that we want to do as an industry is damage the environment that we're trying to encourage people to go out and spend more time in, right? <laughs> so, you know, ethically, morally, as well as from a business perspective, it's just not a smart thing for us to do. So it's part of everything that we do and everything we consider. And I can tell you that in terms of materials, there are a lot of incredible materials that have a lower footprint, no matter how you measure that, whether it's reduced water consumption, whether it's reduced energy consumption, they have lower footprints that we could use. Sometimes cost gets in the way though. And what I mean by that is if we go to more expensive materials, that means less people are going to be able to use them. And so that's always part of the equation. So in terms of a, in terms of a trade-off, I would say the, the big trade-off and one of the things that we focus our innovation efforts on is uh, trying to create more sustainable materials at cost neutral, even less expensive than our, the current materials we're using. And that's a challenge. No, for sure. So do you guys also like pay attention to the fashion landscape too? Like this question is inspired by another one of our followers, Manuel, and he was just wondering, do fashion trends change the direction of R&D? And if so, how? I love that question. And I love that question because we just released a product called Omni Heat Black Dot, which is really the result of years of research on radiative heat transfer. And, you know, I described earlier our product Omni Heat Reflective, which are these little silver dots on a liner of a jacket that reflect your own body heat. Omni heat black dot, as the name implies, little black dots on the exterior of the jacket on the shell fabric. And it, it's a multi-layered, multi-functional, we call it a heat management element. It has first a very thin layer of aluminum. Well, that's the metal part. And on top of that, it has a very thin layer of a black coating. Now, what we discovered in our research was we knew that the metal had low emissivity. Before we move on in this conversation, I'd like to define one term, which is thermal emissivity. 
Thermoemissivity describes the effectiveness in which a surface of a material emits energy as thermal radiation. So let's unpack that a little bit. Thermal radiation is that same sort of energy you feel walking outside on a sunny day, which is from the sun invariably, which is transmitted to the earth via light of various frequencies. So if you're able to tailor the properties of materials to have unique thermal emissivity properties, you can get some interesting results as we are about to describe in this part of the conversation. And so we put the metal on the outside of the jacket in the form of dots, because we want it to remain breathable again. But we put it uh, on the outside of the jacket to limit thermal emissivity into the environment. If you look at all the, and I'm gonna digress here for a second, but you guys are material scientists and engineers, and we already talked about heat transfer, so you're gonna like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the fundamental equations of heat transfer for convection, conduction, and radiation, you know, there are different terms in those equations. If you look at the heat flux, heat flux due to convection, heat flux due to conduction, heat flux due to radiation, different terms in those equations, but there's a common term in every one of those, and that's delta T, the difference in temperature, meaning that heat transfers from where it is to where it ain't, uh, <laughs> depending on the temperature difference between the thing that's, that has the heat to the, to the place that doesn't have the heat. So a human in a cold environment wearing a jacket, you know, that jacket's going to warm up because it's next to your skin. And then the biggest gradient in temperature, the biggest delta T is going to be from the shell fabric to the environment, right? Because you think about it, the, the liner fabric, and then the insulation layer is closer to your body than the shell fabric. The shell fabric is the, is the farthest from your body. And if you're in a cold environment, the biggest difference in temperature between all the layers of the jacket and the cold environment is going to be from the shell. Um, simply because the jackets, it's like a, you know, it's a big, you're basically wearing a blanket. It's going to warm up because it's next to your body. And so we recognize that things we can do to the shell fabric to limit heat transfer to the environment are going to play a big role. And so that's why we recognize that, okay, for years, we've been putting this stuff on the liner fabric, which works, but we should really start to focus our efforts on the shell fabric. So we put these black dots on the shell fabric, the first iteration of the technology, which is aluminum dots but you look like a disco ball walking around, all <laughs> silver dots. Uh, we weren't so sure that, you know, that consumers would, uh, would be crazy about that look. We had a designer on the innovation team at the time, and she said to me, she said, I asked, well, why don't you just make them black? And I thought, well, that's a great idea. The problem with that technically, though, when she first mentioned that, if you take a metal like aluminum and you put a black polymeric coating on it, the emissivity goes back up. So the secret sauce and the part that we figured out was how to put a black coating on a metal without letting the emissivity, the thermal emissivity go back up. So we've created basically a low emissivity fabric that limits your heat transfer from the jacket into the cold environment. The bonus, which we didn't fully appreciate at the time, was because it's black, of course, it's going to absorb solar radiation. Everybody knows that, right? Black absorbs uh, right. sunlight more than, more than white. But what we didn't recognize, and this was a surprising part of the invention, was that because you got this thin black coating on this aluminum layer, that it works very effective as a solar capture mechanism. And so the black layer absorbs solar, converts it to heat. That aluminum layer then conducts it down into the insulation layer. And now, because you're underneath a low emissivity shell fabric, it gets trapped. So we're calling this a heat magnet. And so I'm I realize this is a long answer to your, to your question, but the reason I went through that is because, you know, it, it has a distinct look. The black dots are a little bit glossy. If you look at the product online now or in uh, retail stores, you'll see it, it looks kind of fashionable. Yeah. <laughs> and as it turns out, you know, the question was about fashion and trends. It turns out black and shiny is kind of trending right now, which is just lucky for us because this <laughs> particular product which is nothing but technically based, it really has a fashion element to it that we hope will help it sell. So I appreciate the question for a number of reasons. I went through one of them. The other thing is that when we do our work on the innovation team, we interface with our design team and then they mm -hmm. take it and make it beautiful and put it into a beautiful product. People will, I think, enjoy wearing and be proud to wear. That's awesome that it, you didn't even really think about that at first, you know, with the different coloring, but the fact that, you know, black is in, right, required that 
additional innovation, which really translated to even more technological advancement in that area. That's really cool. Yeah. And actually just a plug for that technology, as I said, we just released it this fall. Um, it's been on the market for a month or two now, but it was just named as one of the top 100 innovations of 2020 by popular science. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We're pretty proud of that. Yeah, cool. It's the first time a low emissivity fabric has ever been integrated to our knowledge, in a garment. Continuing along this steady path of innovation in, in the apparel space. So currently, when we're talking about apparel, we tend to think of clothing primarily being made up of polymeric materials. However, you know, we've been talking a lot about in this interview how there's more work being done to incorporate you know, metals and perhaps even ceramic materials more into the next generation of clothing. You know, what's the purpose of incorporating metals and ceramics into this future of clothing applications? Yeah, so we've been talking about it a little bit, right? We've talked about in particular metals and how at Columbia, at least we're integrating metals into clothing for uh, to keep people warmer. I can give you another example of how we're integrating ceramics into clothing yeah. as well. Clearly, as, as you just indicated, Thomas, most apparel, most clothing is made of polymeric materials. And we've talked about some examples how at Columbia we're integrating metals, very thin layers of metals onto the surface of fabrics. But we're also doing that with ceramics as well, because ceramics have unique properties that metals don't have and that polymers don't have. I mean, polymers are used to make, um, because of their long chain nature, they're used actually to make the, the, the fibers which are used to make the yarns, which are used to make the textiles. And they're the basis of all the natural materials that were used, which we've talked about in this, in this discussion as well. They're just, they just have great properties for clothing and for oxy and many other consumer products and materials. Ceramics tend to be a brittle, right? Metals tend to be a bit stiffer, not quite as, you can't get kind of the flex or the stretch that you can. So you have to integrate them in certain ways. And, you know, I've already talked about with the the metal dots that we put on our fabrics for our OmniHeat products, we integrate them in, in, in the form of little dots so it doesn't impede the normal properties of the fabric, the breathability, the stretch, uh, the drape, right? And so we get around some of the properties, uh, fundamental properties of metals like stiffness by how we marry uh, the metal with the fabric. We've done the same thing with ceramics. We have a product that we call OmniShade Sun Deflector. And that's been on the market since 2018. It's an amazing product. And what it is, is little white dots of ceramic that are placed on the outside of a garment. The purpose of these little white dots, and I'll tell you the material in a second, is to reflect sunlight. Well, that's obvious. And we've already talked about how everybody knows that black materials absorb sunlight. White materials obviously are going to reflect sunlight. But actually, the material that we chose to do this is titanium dioxide right? Ceramic material. Now, because titanium dioxide is normally granular or, or powdery, then we have to actually use a polymeric binder to hold it together. But the vast majority of the material is titanium dioxide. We have these little white dots of titanium dioxide we put on the outside of the material. It reflects solar radiation. So that will mitigate heat absorption by the garment to keep you cooler, right? But it does something else that's really, really important as well in terms of keeping you cooler. And that is this particular material has a high thermal emissivity. And so, you know, we talked about with the metals that have low thermal emissivity, so they, they don't emit, they're just not good at emitting thermal radiation, therefore they retain it. And that's why they work really good on the product I mentioned a second ago, that Omni Heat Black Dot product on the outside shell of the fabric of the jacket. Well, ceramics like titanium dioxide have very high thermal emissivity. And if you're trying to keep cool, then you want to reflect solar radiation, but you also want to emit thermal radiation from your body as much as possible. In fact, this is exactly the basis of the thermal radiators that are used on the International Space Station. If you look at the, the large arrays that, uh, that come off of the space station, you got the solar panels that you know absorb sunlight, convert it to electricity. But because, first of all, space is cold, but you got really efficient radiation transfer from the sun, and so you've got some serious thermal management challenges for spacecraft and for the International Space Station. So they're constantly having to, um, uh, to manage that heat load by either dumping heat or absorbing heat. And so 
It's, it's actually not as talked about as much, but if you actually look at pictures of the International Space Station, there are these, these panels that will fold out that are called thermal radiators, and they're actually white in color. They're there to basically emit thermal radiation, the excess thermal radiation that gets absorbed by the space station. And we've done the same thing to our product that we've had on the market for some time. Put it on t-shirts, long sleeve t-shirts. It's really intended for, for people who love the sun and love the getting out uh, when it's warm and it works. It's very effective at heat mitigation. Wow. Yeah. I really appreciate that you're translating, you know, other technologies and other applications to the advancements that you're making in this industry. That's That's definitely super interesting. And I just wanted to move on to a a little bit of a a different subject, smart materials and smart fabrics, because there seems to be immense growth potential for these materials. Like the U.S. Department of Energy is developing clothing that can change its thermal properties to adapt to the surrounding environment and the wearer's body. And so in your opinion, with your experiences, what role do you envision smart materials playing in outdoor apparel innovations? Yeah, that's, um, I've been fortunate to have what I tell people is a front row seat on the development of smart materials and smart fabrics, because I was a professor at Georgia Tech in the 90s when Sundar Race and Jay Raman, who's still on the faculty there, so he developed what he called the wearable motherboard, which is now in the Smithsonian, which is, at least in some circles, is recognized as kind of the beginning of this whole smart fabrics revolution, really. It's, you're right. I mean, the potential is amazing and it's been amazing for a long time. There's actually a research center now affiliated with MIT called the AFFOA, Advanced Fibers and Fabrics of America, I believe is is what it's called. They're doing some really amazing things as well as kind of, um, and there are a lot of groups around the country and around the world that are doing some really amazing things in academia. There are also some industrial groups that have done some really amazing work as well. And I think there's, there's been some widespread application in the military in terms of integration of smart, some kind of a smart feature to a, to a fabric and, or mm-hmm. to a garment. And also in the medical community, also sports technology too, teams and training and stuff sure. like that, yep. uh, you know, monitoring physiology or, or, right. or vitals. So a lot of the stuff that's used in the medical community can, can translate to sports as well. But I'm still, I think we're all still trying to find or develop the next killer application for those kinds of materials and, and, and fabrics and stuff. We, we spend a lot of time looking at it. We spend a lot of time thinking about what could be two challenges in the way. One is cost, which we've already talked about. And again, I don't want to overemphasize that, but it's one of the things that that I don't think in at the university level we do that much of. And I know I mentioned that a second ago. <laughs> um, um, but it is important, you know, if you want to reach a, a broad audience, uh, you, that has to be considered. But the other thing is wash durability. You know, for clothing, people like to wash it. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. Uh, at some, point. <laughs> some people wash it more often than others, but, uh, you know, clothing. You still got to like, wash it. It gets washed at some point, right? And, you know, the interconnects, you know, if you, if you have to have a power source or if you have to have, you know, different components of whatever type that, that you need in order to put your device or your smart product together, the interconnects, all the flexing that goes on in the washing machine, yeah. um, it's really tough in terms of durability to maintain. Now, it's not to say that people haven't done it. People certainly have done it. But I think those two challenges are, are really kind of roadblocks to more widespread, I think, offerings of of smart fabrics to the general public. We have at the company, we've got some great ideas for some really great products that would be really, I think, well-received and and broadly adopted if we could tackle the cost and the wash durability issues. Looking at this next generation of materials and in apparel and the future of outdoor apparel, how are some of the products that you've been working and developing, how do they play into that future? And you know, where do you even see that future going beyond what you've done now and what you might be doing in five or 10 years in the same space? Yeah. So we, we spent a good bit of time today talking about how we're integrating different materials together and uh, in order to create product to keep people warm, dry, cool, and protected so they can stay outside longer. So the answer to your direct answer to your question is just 
look at the paradigms of what people are doing in terms of product development, in terms of material use, and, and ask yourself, based on fundamentals, based on history, is there a different way to do this, right? And so, because I think there's a lot to be learned by just applying good fundamentals. There's a lot to be learned from examining history as well and, and trying to figure out why are, you know, just asking why. Why are we using these materials or this collection of materials for this product? And so the example I'll give is something we talked about a little bit today, which is the waterproof breathables. You know, these fabric membrane laminates that keep the rain out, but actually allow the body, your, your moisture vapor coming off your body to get through them. So they're breathable and yet uh, waterproof. You know, those are trade-offs. Uh, you want it to be waterproof and breathable. Well, if you want it to be waterproof, you want to wear, you want to wear something with no holes in it right? It's completely hydrophobic. If you want it to be breathable, you want it to either have microscopic holes in it, or you want it to have some side of it to be hydrophilic. So it will absorb moisture and then transport it to the other side and then get through the fabric. So, you know, and and we talked about earlier how a company called Gore kind of created that as a separate category by recognizing that their expanded polytetrafluoroethylene membrane could be laminated to a fabric, create a fabric membrane laminate that had a really good balance of waterproofness and breathability. And that was in the 70s, 1970s. And then ever since then, everyone kind of followed the leader in terms of developing alternative competitive materials of putting a membrane next to a fabric. And now for these constructions, the fabric was always on the outside and the membrane was on the inside. And that's because the, the, uh, the EPTFE membrane, less than 30 microns thick, very fragile, not very abrasion resistant, prone to to picking uh, or puncture. And so the, the membrane had to go on the inside of the fabric. Well, in order for the entire construction to work, the fabric now had to be made as hydrophobic as possible. Uh, so it had to shed water because if that fabric were to saturate via rain, then the whole construction would stop breathing because in order to breathe, the reason breathing works, I mean, uh, mean, moisture vapor has to transfer from an area of high concentration to low concentration, right, in order for that to work. And if the fabric is saturated, that, that's referred to in the industry as wet out, then you're effectively killing your breathability because now you don't have a moisture vapor gradient or moisture vapor pressure gradient from the inside to the outside. And so they had to put these chemicals on the fabric that, are, that we refer to as durable water repellents. Originally, they were perfluorochemical containing or PFCs. Uh, now there's a mix of both PFC as well as PFC free, but hydrophobic finishes that are applied to the fabric to keep it from wetting out so these fabric membrane laminates can continue to breathe. So in 2016, and I wasn't at the company at the time, Columbia Sportswear recognized, the innovation team recognized that, you know, or asked the question, why are we doing it this way? Why are we, why is the entire industry creating? a waterproof breathable laminate by putting the membrane on the inside and and not the outside. We've got new materials now that are tough, are abrasion resistant. We can put them on the outside. And when we do that, it solves a lot of problems. Number one, you never, with the fabric not on the outside, you never get wet out. So that just is not even an issue anymore. Number two, because you don't have the fabric on the outside, you don't have to use PFCs. You don't have to use any DWR at all on the fabric. So it solves that problem. So it solves the wet out problem. You don't have to use PFCs, which is something that the industry is uh, slowly trying to get away from. Number three, easy to clean. You got the membrane on the outside. It gets all nasty and dirty. If you're out in the outside, you just wipe it clean, right? As opposed to a fabric where dirt and grime and tree sap and everything else can get down in between the yarns. Much yeah. more difficult to clean. Number four, and really important, when the moisture comes off your body now, as opposed to hitting a membrane and depending on the temperature, condensing inside your jacket and, there, and therefore making you wet from the inside, it actually hits a fabric, which actually can spread the moisture and make the membrane that's on the outside easier to process. And so we created this construction. Our product is called Out Dry Extreme, and it's completely different from anything else out on the market. We've got this membrane on the outside. It's tough. It's uh, abrasion resistant, it's highly breathable, and it's waterproof. Yeah, no, I just love how you put that emphasis on just because that's the way it's always been done doesn't mean that that's the best solution. And especially even if in the past there was a reason for it, 
that doesn't mean there's no alternative right now. So that's a really cool example. You know, we, we've really covered a lot today in this conversation about materials innovations in apparel. So I'd love for you to bottom line it for us and give our listeners a few key points that they can take away from this conversation as a whole. I'm going to repeat a couple of things I've said a couple of times throughout this. Don't forget your fundamentals. Don't forget your high school chemistry. Don't forget your heat transfer. Don't forget your introduction to material science and engineering. You know, no matter what you do, whether you go into material science or you go into the outdoor industry or, or anything else, if you love the outdoors, there are opportunities at Columbia and, and all of all kinds of companies in order to apply those fundamentals to create really cool materials that help people get outside and stay outside longer. We, as I said earlier, you know, this is this job is an opportunity for me to combine two of my passions. And, you know, I just look forward to, to doing it moving forward. And so if our listeners want to be able to reach out to you, what's the best way to connect with you? Is that through LinkedIn, through email? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably a good place to start. I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, we can throw your uh, LinkedIn link in the show notes for our listeners. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Haskell, for for coming on to this show. Like, We really learned a lot in all the examples you gave us, You know, even the history of clothing. That was all super cool and super interesting to me and to Tom. So we really appreciate you coming onto the show. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, guys, to do this. It's been fun. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material Worlds podcast. We look forward to releasing our next episode in two weeks. Please subscribe to our podcast feed in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. And tell your friends about our show on social media. But until then... If you want to hear from us, we are on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Follow or subscribe to us on those platforms to keep up to date with all things It's Material Worlds between our episodes. Links to our social media sites will also be in the show notes. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear it. We are just getting started with the podcast and want to grow this show with our community's input. You can send us feedback through messaging on any of our social media sites. Also, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. But until then, take care and stay healthy.